In the last hundred years, Los Angeles has grown, has changed and expanded its boundaries. But throughout much of the 20th century, at the corner of 3rd and Hill Streets, Los Angeles has remained virtually unchanged. The Angels Flight Incline Railway, in continuous operation from 1901 to 1969, occupies a special place in the hearts and minds of Los Angeles residents. And the one thing I do distinctly remember as a young kid is that one ride would not do. You had to ride, or we had to ride Angel's Flight more than once. It was really kind of a scary situation because it cracked and creaked, and especially as they emerged and went their separate ways and then came back onto the main track. But it was always exciting. It was the quintessential landmark of Los Angeles. Some would say our most beloved. 27 years older than the Los Angeles City Hall and regarded as a modern miracle when it opened in 1901, Angel's Flight began its life to serve a basic transportation need. 68 years later, it had served that need over 150 million times. Say the words, Angel's Flight, to a native Angelino, and the overwhelming response is, when is it coming back? Almost everyone who has been downtown before 1969 has seen or ridden on Angel's Flight, and millions more have seen the little railroad in movies and television shows. I'm Carmen Zapata, a longtime resident of Los Angeles, and I have some exciting news. As you watch this program, the restoration has already begun, and soon, very soon, Angel's Flight, the shortest railway in the world, will return to Bunker Hill. The actual cars, station house, and archway are being reused. In a city where a building from the 50s or 60s is considered historic, the return of Angel's Flight cements our desire to celebrate our history while progressing into the next century. It will retake its place, along with the restored and expanded Grand Central Market, the preserved Bradbury Building, the new Central Library, the redesigned Pershing Square, the expanded Convention Center, the all-new Metro Rail subway system, and the rest of the revitalized and exciting downtown Los Angeles. This area right here was the heart of Los Angeles nearly 100 years ago. Los Angeles had been a city for over 100 years when Bunker Hill first began to be developed. And in the 1890s, as people began settling on Bunker Hill and building their elegant houses, they needed a way to get from the top of the hill to the markets and businesses at the bottom, including the Grand Central Market, which still stands today. A new arrival to Los Angeles, Colonel J.W. Eddy, had an idea. He had moved to Los Angeles in 1895. Eddy was thought to be a close friend of Abraham Lincoln, and he served in the Union Army during the Civil War. Eddy proposed building a cable car railway line linking Bunker Hill with the rest of Los Angeles. In May of 1901, he petitioned the city council for a franchise to build his railway. The City Council granted the petition, but added a condition to it. Colonel Eddy would have to build an adjoining staircase so that his railway would not be a monopoly on the trip up and down the hill. In August of 1901, construction of the stairway and railway began. And as the railway began to take shape, local citizens began to deluge Colonel Eddy with letters of commendation. Since commencing the work on on the Third Street Hill, I've been overwhelmed with flattering words. What a wonderful transformation you have wrought. This is the most unique, useful, and beautiful improvement ever undertaken in the city. This project adds to the value of every interest in the city. Eddie's Railway 
Park was completed in December of 1901, and on December 31st, it was dedicated in a spirited ceremony at the top of Bunker Hill. Eddie called the railway Angel's Flight, and he offered free rides all day and for the entire first week. And on that first day, almost 2,000 riders took him up on his offer. Eddie was so taken by the public response to his new railway that he installed a ceremonial fare box at the top of the hill and remarked, During this week, no charges will be made, but a receptacle will be conveniently placed where each person can deposit such a sum on his first ride as his public spirit and liberality may dictate. The box had an opening large enough to accommodate a $20 gold piece, and one gentleman was seen to drop in a $5 gold piece. Not a bad take, considering the one-way fare of one cent, the equivalent of 500 rides on Angel's Flight. In addition to Angel's Flight, Colonel Eddy built a 100-foot tall observation tower at the top of the hill. Called Angel's Rest or Angel's Roost, it provided a spectacular view of the entire city. After climbing the tower, Mayor Snyder congratulated Colonel Eddy on his monumental expansion of the city's transit facilities and reminisced on how the city had changed in the 20 years since he had first arrived. Angel's flight was an immediate success. The flight traveled from the base of Bunker Hill at Hill Street up to Olive Street the Angel's Flight funicular was the model of simplicity. By definition, a funicular is a railway that utilizes two cars connected to each other by the same cable. The two cars, named Olivet and Sinai, counterbalance each other. As one ascends, the other descends, with the assistance of a small electric motor to help overcome friction. The cars travel at a top speed of three and a half miles per hour with both cars reaching the opposite end at the same time. The ride lasts about one minute, and the distance traveled is just a little longer than the size of a football field. And in the middle of the line, the two cars pass within a few inches of each other. Angel's Flight was one of many short funicular railways. In fact, downtown Los Angeles had a second railway of this kind called Court Flight, which operated only a few blocks away until 1944. As originally built in 1901, Angel's Flight operated at two grades, with a gradual ascent to Clay Street and then a much steeper grade for the remainder of the trip to Olive Street. In 1905, the route was rebuilt into a uniform 33% grade, and new cars were built with a seat slant of 33%, which allowed the passengers to sit upright on the entire trip. During this time, the round-trip fare was raised to five cents. In 1912, at the age of 70, Colonel Eddy retired and sold Angel's Flight to the funding company of Los Angeles. At this time, the flight was classified by the state of California as a railway, officially making it the shortest railway in the world. The city of Los Angeles, however, decided to disregard the state and retain the classification of Angel's Flight as an elevator. The funding company's ownership of the line lasted less than two years, and in 1914, Angel's Flight was sold to the Continental Securities Company. A young fellow named Robert Moore became the manager of the flight, and it prospered during his management over the next 38 years. Downtown Los Angeles was a center of commerce and trade, and Angel's Flight was right in the heart of this bustling city. By 1924, it was transporting over 1,000 people per day, and the flight grossed $35,795, with a profit of almost $10,000 that year. Although Angel's Flight was popular with local residents, in 1935, the city, which had originally classified the flight as an elevator, proposed that the flight be torn down and replaced with a modern elevator. Newspapers editorialized, and the council chambers filled with loyal Angel's Flight riders. Not only was the proposal quickly dropped, but the city council offered Angel's Flight a new 10-year franchise, 
and the popular flight continued on its way up and down Bunker Hill. By 1945, Angel's flight was carrying about 6,000 passengers per day. Yet, once again, as the franchise was set to expire, talk turned to dismantling Angel's flight and replacing it with something more modern. The still current manager, Robert Moore, remarked at the time, The war didn't bother our passengers travel any. No sense in changing a business that makes money. And you never hear of anybody in San Francisco trying to eliminate the cable cars, do you? Moore demonstrated his love for the flight that same year. Continental Securities decided to sell Angel's flight, and at age 79, Robert Moore purchased it himself. The post-war years saw a rapid growth in Los Angeles, and that growth was mirrored by the burgeoning Hollywood film industry. Angel's Flight became a popular location for films. It seemed no director could resist a chase scene, clandestine meeting, or just a picturesque transition using Angel's Flight as a movie set. In the same year that he won the Oscar for Best Actor in the film Stalag 17, William Holden was riding Angel's Flight as part of his lead role in The Turning Point. 446, wherein is hidden Mrs. Stefan Nova, alias Mrs. Manzanares. In the movies, much like real life, they'd ride up, then down, then up, Take it easy, honey. And then down again. There was even a dramatic film produced called Angel's Flight, though it remains unreleased to this day. In 1952, Robert Moore felt he needed to retire, and Moore sold the flight to a partnership headed by Lester Moreland. Within a short time, the partnership reorganized into a family operation with Lester as the chief engineer and president, his wife Helen as the secretary treasurer and publicist, and his father Frank as vice president. It was a family operation from the standpoint that my dad ran the business, not the cars. He ran the business. My mother ran the books. Now to run the books, for a railroad. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but it involves more than counting the tickets you sold and how many nickels you take in. My grandfather Lester, he always made us buy a ticket. We didn't just go walk on the flight and uh, as though we owned the place, which we did, but he always had us buy a ticket. He would, of course, give us the money to buy the ticket, but we had to buy a ticket just like everybody else did. It was a working investment, and from the standpoint you put your money into this thing, you just didn't stand around and wait for it to come back. It took a lot of work to run that flight. By 1956, the costs of operating the flight were catching up with the one-way fare, which had not changed since the days of Colonel Eddy. To compensate the owners for the expenses of operating the ride, the price of ticket books was increased from 50 one-way rides for 50 cents to 30 rides for 50 cents. No change was made in the single ticket price of five cents for one round trip, a fare that had been in effect for over 40 years. By 1956, it was estimated that since it opened, over 100 million trips had been taken on Angel's flight. That's almost 50 times the entire population of Los Angeles at that time. The history of Angel's Flight is intertwined with the history of Los Angeles, and specifically the history of Bunker Hill. And Bunker Hill was changing. The stately homes and hotels became rooming houses and apartments. Many fell into total disrepair. In the 1950s, Bunker Hill really wasn't a very nice place. Uh, the housing uh, was uh, rather poor. Crime was high in the area. There were health problems and social problems, uh, and so, uh, and there were also fire problems. 
So Bunker Hill really was a blighted area uh, in the 1950s. The city's Community Redevelopment Agency, charged with the task of revitalizing Bunker Hill, began purchasing the vacant and dilapidated buildings and tearing them down. But Angel's Flight remained in operation. As a result of this slow transition, there were fewer and fewer people living on Bunker Hill, which meant fewer people to utilize Angel's Flight. In 1962, Angel's Flight was declared Los Angeles Cultural Historic Landmark Number 4. Later that same year, the flight was sold to the city of Los Angeles for $35,000. It was to be managed by the Redevelopment Agency and operated by Sidney Smith, the vice president of the Oliver Williams Elevator Company. At first, Smith considered it a simple business contract, but once he began operating the flight, Smith's attitude changed and he and his wife became the last in a line of dedicated flight operators. Smith took his responsibilities for Angel's flight seriously, carefully repainting the flight and seeing that it operated daily through May of 1969. Angel's flight seemed to be the last remaining structure on Bunker Hill. The homes and rooming houses had been removed and replaced by parking lots. Parking lot patrons became the only passengers on the flight in its last few years. It was always the intent of the city of Los Angeles to preserve Angel's Flight, and as the redevelopment of Bunker Hill continued, the time came to clear the land at Angel's Flight. The sign announced that the flight would return, and for the final weekend, much like the inaugural week in 1901, all rides were free. In the final years, Many people came downtown to experience Angel's Flight, some for the last of many rides, and others for their first and only experience on the flight. Being a seven-year-old little boy and riding Angel's Flight, you would never think in your mind that this was used as public transportation. It was actually a ride that you could just go and have fun with, go back and forth, up and down all the time. All day long you could almost do it. My father probably read in the paper that it was going to be the last weekend and they decided to instill this piece of historical culture on their two uh, lovely daughters. And so we went down to Angel's Flight and they were, my mother was saying, it's like, you know, this is the last weekend and we, they're going to take you down and they, sh we, you know, we read the plaque uh, that they have the, the photograph of us in front that it will be uh, torn down and reconstructed in a couple of years and they go well you know we have to go on it now because it's not going to be uh, running or won't be here um, after today. It was very exciting. Yeah, it, it was, was my fun. first time. When the flight was dismantled great attention was paid to detail. Every element of the flight from the tracks to the cables to the gears and the cars was photographed and noted to ensure accurate restoration. Angel's flight was shipped to storage, awaiting a return in the near future to Bunker Hill. Originally, it was to be only a short waiting period of a few years. But the restoration of Angel's flight was dependent on other factors in the Bunker Hill development, especially the unpredictable real estate market. First, the original site would fulfill a pressing need in the downtown area and become a low-cost seniors housing project. A new site was selected, which was a few hundred feet to the south of the original Angel's Flight. That site would be part of a later development phase of Bunker Hill. It was projected that this phase would be completed in the 1980s, but with the economic recession and the slowdown in real estate development throughout Southern California, the completion was delayed. By 1989, uh, the two office towers had been completed, but the third office tower, which would be right adjacent to Angel's Flight, was not completed. And I think the conventional wisdom was, well, we will wait until that third office tower is finished. The way our, re our real estate economy is going in downtown Los Angeles, particularly high-rise office buildings, that if we have to wait until that third office tower is finished, uh, we may be waiting another 10 to 15 years, if not longer. 
Olivet and Sinai remain indoors awaiting restoration. But the restoration was a long time coming. Community activists, preservationists, and just plain citizens saw that they needed to help the city of Los Angeles in its monumental task to finally restore Angel's Flight. I thought the um, station house in the arch was destroyed in 1969, but I found out they were preserved in the storage house. When I got there, it looked like a junkyard to me. Um, it looked like actually the buildings were all deteriorating and falling apart. And um, so I took this, the pictures and sent them to the CRA and asked them. I said, we're going to have to do something about these. What happened was the CRA saw the pictures, and they were su very surprised, as I was, to see that the buildings were actually in a junkyard and that they were falling apart. Usually when you send things to like agencies or things like that, um, you run into a stone wall, but it ends up that when I sent my pictures to the CRA, they were glad about it and it really helped them see what was happening with their buildings like Angel's Flight. I don't want to see Angel's Flight wind up like Court Flight. Court Flight is gone and it's never coming back. Angel's Flight must come back. One of the first steps toward restoration was the return of the major elements of the flight to downtown Los Angeles. On October 31, 1991, in the middle of the night, they returned to the foot of Bunker Hill. The move actually started uh, late at night, uh, around 11 p.m., and lasted all night uh, with the structures arriving in their present uh, location in downtown Los Angeles about uh, 5 a.m. the next morning. Um, it was certainly, as all moves, uh, exciting because there's always the element of unknown. Uh, there is always a risk. Uh, so uh, you don't start breathing easily until the structures have arrived at their destination. In, in order to uh, produce the plans and specifications and estimates that are required for construction project or restoration and rehabilitation of uh, Angel's Flight, uh, it required uh, a team that uh, consists of an architectural firm, a structural engineering uh, t uh, member, uh, surveying uh, uh, member, a st structural uh, transportation uh, member to handle the uh, track structure, and uh, also uh, our historical uh, preservation consultant. The setting will be different and there will be some new elements for instance there'll be different kinds of electrical equipment inside the cars, um, things that will be in the station house that, that will be needed for the new cabling system and the new track and trestle system. But as far as looking at the arch and as one would have remembered it or looking at the interior of the station house we think we can be very faithful to what the original looked like and that the the viewer who saw it as a child, for instance, or before it was dismantled, will know that there are some elements that are clearly new, but, we, but the, the great preponderance of the station house and the arch and the cars will be clearly restored to what they remember. And in many cases, maybe in better condition than what they remember. There was a lot of debate about the exact location of the top station of Angel's Flight, and it's very important to understand some engineering aspects of this. Angel's Flight used to go at about, I think it's a 33 degree angle. And there was a proposal in um, the works for the Angel's Flight reconstruction to have a station at what is the 370 above, 370 foot above sea level portion of the California Plaza project. And that would make the angle too low to use the old cars. Also, it wouldn't be having the funicular go to the top. And that's what funiculars do. They go to the tops of things. And so a concerted effort was made to finally forge a compromise, and the result was the decision that Angel's flight would go to the top, the 385 feet above sea level. Bingo, by doing that, it allowed the angle to be the same, therefore the old cars could be used. I think Angel's flight symbolically is one of the most important restorations or historic preservation projects for downtown Los Angeles. It is so symbolically important to those people who grew up in Los Angeles. It is a part of most people's memories of going downtown. Angel's Flight has always been a very integral part of Bunker Hill because we feel it's the main link to the past. This is what people remember about Bunker Hill, that Angel's Flight was there. And so we've had many calls through the years saying, when are you going to put it back? 
Uh, of course, for years it didn't make any sense to put it back to nothing, uh, leading to nothing. And, uh, but uh, now is the time where it can go back. We think it's a very important part of the circulation system for pedestrians up and down the hill, just like it did before. We think this is a very important historical tie to the past. Uh, and people, frankly, want it, and we want to give it to them. Los Angeles is a vibrant city, and you need only look downtown to witness the excitement of renewal. The expanded and remodeled Grand Central Market, the majestic Bradbury Building, the rebuilt Central Library, the reshaped contours of Pershing Square, and new additions to the Convention Center. These are the symbols of the new downtown Los Angeles. Linking people to the new downtown are modern transportation systems. These sleek new railways bring employees, shoppers, and tourists from near and far to the heart of the new downtown. Right here to the corner of 4th and Hill Streets and right to Angel's Flight. And just a few steps from this red line station is the spot where the new Angel's Flight will once again ascend Bunker Hill. Here, the restoration of the old arch and station house will continue until reconstruction is completed. You can visit this workshop site and watch as the restoration process progresses. And soon, you'll be able to ride up the hill to California Plaza above at the top of Bunker Hill. Plans for the new Angel's Flight are now ready. The restored flight will mirror the experience of the original flight. And most importantly, in addition to the original arch and station house to greet passengers, you will be able to ride Angel's Flight in the newly refurbished Olivet and Sinai. Engineers, architects, and preservationists are working together to ensure the historical integrity of the original Angel's Flight while maintaining today's standards for safety and disabled access. I, I can't wait for the Angel's Flight to come back because I would like to see my grandchildren, five of them, be able to see what Los Angeles was like back then. It was really a nice little community and we were just real proud of it. And uh, I really want them to have that experience, each one of them. And she won't be waiting long because as you watch this video, work has already begun on the construction phase of restoring Angel's Flight. And once again, in late 1995 or early 1996, the shortest railway in the world will again transport millions to new heights, to the center of the downtown Los Angeles of the 21st century. It's a part of history that um, no one will ever know unless it does return. I feel that when Angel's Flight goes back in, this is our, uh, we would have met our commitment to uh, to the people of Los Angeles to put this uh, very important historic icon back. One of the things that was really interesting to me about this restoration project was the challenge of the reuse of these original cars to, for today's passenger. In other words, you are, you are meshing very old historic fabric, very old wood, something that maybe wasn't meant to last this long. Um, and putting it on top of a brand new system. And the challenge of integrating all of that modern technology into a little wooden car that's going to travel just about the same route and making it do that in the same way that it did since the, the beginning decades of the century uh, was, was a really interesting challenge and required both the engineering technology that it takes to do that and yet the preservation and conservation techniques that we have all um, come to have for the project. Angel's Flight helps bring us together. It helps bring Los Angeles together. Los Angeles has, for many years, uh, been written off as uh, not having anything uh, in the way of uh, historically or architecturally significant buildings is uh, something that we're constantly trying to put to rest. Uh, it's, I, actually, the opposite is more, much more true. There was no ride that you can really compare it to. I can't wait to ride it. As soon as it's there, as soon as it's opened, I'm there and I would love to take the